Hi guys, welcome back for another video. I'm really excited about filming this video today because it has been one of the most common questions that I have gotten in my messages on Instagram and my emails lately. And so I wanted to share all of the information in one place. So the focus of today's video is going to be on how I became a Creighton practitioner. I'm going to share all about my journey, how I got interested, how I got involved, what the training looked like, what the education program was looked like, the time commitment, financial commitment, things like that, so that if this is something that you're feeling called to, you can more thoroughly discern whether or not this is for you based on my experience and what I have to share about it. So if you haven't heard me talk about this before, I started using Using the Creighton Model Fertility Care System, which is a type of natural family planning or a fertility awareness based method. I started using this myself personally with my fiance at the time, my husband now, when we were engaged in 2017. We started using the method when we got married in 2018 for family planning purposes. And then in 2019, that's when I began my journey to becoming a Creighton practitioner myself. Ever since I first heard about NFP back when I was in grad school about five or so years ago, I heard about Creighton first and I fell in love with it because I couldn't believe that this was something that I had never heard of before, that this was something teaching women and couples about their bodies and their fertility and their reproductive health and how could we not all have this information at our fingertips. So as soon as I heard about it, I knew I wanted to learn it. And then as soon as I learned it, I knew I wanted to go and become educated so that I could teach other women and other couples about this too. From the beginning of the time that I knew about it, I always felt called to go down the path and to get trained myself so that I could teach others by becoming a practitioner. This was something I prayed a lot about. I just knew that it was something that I wanted to pursue, but because it is a big time and financial commitment, I didn't think it was something I was gonna be able to do right away. I thought it was something that I would pray about for years, save up for for years, and then do it later on. Because I talk so much about Creighton and so much about my love for it and about how I wanted to become a practitioner, people who knew me knew that about me. I had reached out to our archdiocese to see if there was any scholarships possibly to send me to get trained, but there wasn't any available at that time. So I just thought it was something I would continue to pray about and wait for. In the summer of 2019, I got reached out to by a friend who knew that it was a dream of mine to get trained as a practitioner and she let me know that somebody that she knew had a scholarship available to send a few people who wanted to get trained to an education center to become Creighton practitioners. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes, a hundred percent. To talk a little bit about the financial investment of Creighton. So the way that you have to see this, which really I did not understand when I was first starting out, is that you are doing a post-grad program. It is a full education training program. You get certified at the end of it. This is an allied health profession. So essentially you're doing a certification program through a university in an allied health profession. So it's a big deal. It's a big financial commitment. It's a big time commitment. So you do have to know that going into it. The education program itself, and I'm gonna link in the description box below the website where you can find all the information about the education programs, the education programs that are currently running because they have them in different locations and an info packet that has all the details about the finances and everything else that's required. Basically, to become a practitioner, the cost is around $5,000. That doesn't include like the books and material that you need to purchase, your flights to get to the training program, and then it also doesn't include your on-site visit, which I'll talk about later where you're gonna fly your supervisor to where you live for them to observe you. So there's a lot of additional costs that would be at least a couple thousand more in addition to the 5,000 that it costs for the practitioner training program. Now, this is not something that most people pay for on their own. A lot of times people will get sponsorships or scholarships. Places that you can look for those are your diocese, your local churches, parishes, organizations that may fund this. So it could be even Catholic schools that want these training programs accessible to them in the area. It could be crisis pregnancy centers where they may support you to go get this training and then you're gonna in turn come and train the women at the center so that they can learn about their bodies and their health and their fertility. So there's a lot of different ways that you can get scholarships and sponsorships to help pay for this training program. 
So the first thing that you do is you fill out an application online and then someone will contact you for an interview. So you have a phone call with someone or at least that's how it worked for me. I filled out the application, sent it in, and then I had a phone call interview to talk about the program. They asked me questions about myself, my interest in the training program. I asked them questions. We talked about the different time commitments and other things involved to make sure it was gonna be a good fit. And then once I got officially accepted and approved to come to the training program, it was happening the following month. So the main training center is at the Pope Paul VI Research Institute in Omaha, Nebraska. That's their main location. That's where Creighton comes out of. But there's also remote training programs around the country and even around the world. So I know there's some in Mexico. They've done some in other countries as well. The training program that I went to was in New York. I know there's one in Florida as well. So in that website that I'm going to link below, you'll be able to see all of the training center options to see if maybe there's one closer to you or if it makes the most sense to go out to Omaha, Nebraska. So like I said, the one that I went to was in New York and I really liked this because it was the first year that this particular center was hosting an education program. So because of that, it was such a small group. So when you go to Omaha, I believe there's between 50 to 100, something like that amount of people that are there. So you get to know some of them, but it's a much bigger group. My training program was only five of us. So it was very intimate. We all got to know each other really well. We got to know the educators really well and it just felt like such a nice cozy little group and I feel so close to all of the women that were there. Before you get to your first education program you get mailed your books. So one of the things you get mailed is this big binder with lots of information and assignments and paperwork and what to expect and that kind of thing and then you get three textbooks. You get an anatomy and physiology textbook, a book for education phase one, and a book for education phase two. And you're expected to read the anatomy and physiology textbook and the book for education phase one before getting there. The way that the training program works is that it's split up into two education phases, EP1 and EP2, and they happen a number of months apart and each of them are a week long and they're very intensive training programs because that's where you're getting trained. It's only a week long. So we would be in class from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., something like that. And then we would be studying from like 7 p.m. until 11, go to sleep and then wake up and do it the next day. So they're very intensive programs. I don't have any background in science. So the most science that I took was like a intro to biology, intro to chemistry type of thing in college. And that was it. I studied psychology and marriage and family therapy. So I didn't have science background. A lot of the people that I was training with were either already doctors or nurses. They'd been to medical school or they had done really intense science training before. So they had a lot of background that I didn't have. I had never taken an anatomy and physiology class in my life. And so all of this was new to me. I knew how to chart. I had been using the Creighton model, but I didn't know all of the science background that goes into it. So for me, EP1 was super intense and a lot of work to learn. For example, the anatomy and physiology textbook, we went through that in a day and a half, maybe two days at most, a whole textbook, learning everything. It was so much, it was so overwhelming for me. I was staying up for hours and hours studying after we finished training because it just science is not something that comes naturally to the way that my brain thinks. You learn so so much especially in that first week that first EP education phase one you learn so much so much science background so much about charting so much about the history of natural family planning in general and how we got to the Creighton model all the research that's gone into this method. It's so important everything you learn is so valuable but it's just a lot. At least I felt a bit like you're drinking from a fire hydrant, like everything is coming at you at once and it's a lot, but it's definitely doable, especially um, for those who do have a science background. A lot of doctors and nurses and other medical professionals get training in Creighton to add on to the medical training they already have. But if you don't have any science background, you can still absolutely do it. You'll just be like me and you'll have a little bit more to learn, a little more catching up to do because you don't have that background. When you're at education phase one, in addition to being in class and studying, you also are going to have assignments every day and I believe there was two exams. You had like a midweek exam and then a final exam. So you have to pass your exams, you have to pass your assignments, you have to do the work. Imagine, like I said, that you're in a post-grad program, all the things that you would expect from that, you could expect from this. When EP1 concludes and you pass your exams and you're gonna do great, then you get assigned a supervisor. 
So when you leave EP1, you now are working under supervision. You have some assignments that you're gonna go home and do before you can start working with clients. And then you're gonna start seeing clients almost right away, a couple weeks later after you leave training. You have enough knowledge by that point to be able to work with your clients and you're working under supervision. So if anything comes up that you have questions about, you have a go-to person who can answer all of those questions for you. Once you leave EP1, the minimum number of clients required before you go to EP2 is six. Client sessions range anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour and a half, I would say. And then you have paperwork to do for each client afterwards. So you're taking notes on each client, you're filling out a bunch of forms that you have in their file. You keep a file on each client. You're gonna have a filing cabinet that has um, a lock on it so that it's secure and confidential. So I have a little filing cabinet in our storage closet that I have all my client files in and I add their paperwork from each follow-up to that so that I can pull their file out whenever we have follow-ups and I remember everything that we've talked about in the past. I have all those records and we can pick up right wherever we left off. So there is a significant time commitment to seeing clients and then doing the paperwork associated with seeing the clients that you're gonna do after you finish your session with them. Then as part of your supervision internship between EP1 and EP2 and also after EP2, after you have two follow-ups with a client, you're going to scan your entire file worth of paperwork for that client and send it to your supervisor for feedback to make sure you're doing everything properly. That is a time-consuming process. The follow-up form is pretty lengthy. There's a lot of pages. There's there's a lot of details and there's a lot of specifics that you need to do exactly right to follow the standardization of the Creighton model. So you're gonna be taking lots of pictures or lots of scanning happening, sending it off to your supervisor, working with her very closely, getting a lot of feedback, redoing things that are incorrect. So that is definitely a time consuming process, but you learn a lot and it's an important part of learning. I think that's the one thing that I had no idea what I was getting myself into was just how much work this was going to be. I knew how to chart and so I kind of was like, I know how to chart so it's gonna be easy for me to become a trained practitioner and be able to teach other people because I already know what I'm doing. But I didn't know any of the science background. I didn't know how much time I needed to dedicate to this actual training program. Like I thought we would just go for the week, I would start seeing clients, the end. I don't know, I didn't really do my research to know what I was getting myself into. I kind of think it was maybe better that way because I didn't know just how much work it was going to be. It's absolutely something you can do while working, while having a full-time job, while having a family, things like that, but it just will take a lot of your time and your time management skills to be able to add this into your life if you're already working and have kids and a husband and things at home. After you have EP1, then you go home, you get your supervisor, you are working under supervision, you're seeing your clients, you're sending your paperwork off to your supervisor. You're also meeting with your supervisor monthly. Those meetings are not too long, like I would say between 30 to 60 minutes, depending on how much you have to talk about and go over with your clients that month. But once a month, one hour at the most is how much I would meet with my supervisor. And those me meetings were really helpful because any questions that would come up, anything I was confused about, then I could ask her, we could go over my clients, make sure that I was managing them all properly and make sure I was learning everything that I needed to learn. If you have done all of your assignments, passed all of your assignments, you've seen the amount of clients that you need to see in order to move on to EP2, then you move on to EP2. So our first education phase was in August of 2019 and our second one was supposed to be in April of 2020, but that was a couple weeks after COVID hit and so ours was delayed until August of 2020, but normally it would have been sooner. So in August of 2020, I went back up to New York for EP2. EP2, in my opinion, and this is what I've heard from a lot of people, is way, way, way less intense than EP1. Because you already have all the background, you already have the basis of the information that you need, EP2 just expands on that. So you're looking at more complicated cases, more difficult charts to manage and things like that, but you already know the foundation of the information that you need to know. You're just 
building upon it. So you go to EP2, you still have class from about 8 a.m. to 6 or 7 p.m. There's assignments to do, there's exams that you have throughout the week that you need to pass. Again, like I said, much less intense than EP1. For me, EP1 was a lot of information. I needed to study a lot each night. EP2 was much more digestible, much more calm. I felt very relaxed when I was there. It was very, very different from EP1. When you leave EP2, then you have your supervised practicum number two. So it goes EP1, supervised practicum one, EP2, supervised practicum two. So you leave EP2 and then you have about eight assignments, I believe, that you need to complete. You have deadlines for each of them, so you need to do your assignments, you get feedback, they get graded. If you don't pass them sufficiently, then your supervisor is going to let you know what's wrong, what you need to correct, which ones you need to redo, and then you'll redo them. Once you leave EP2, you need a minimum of 12 new clients. So after EP1, you got a minimum of six clients. Now you're getting 12 new clients. So you have 18 total clients by the time you finish your second supervised practicum. I never had a problem getting new clients. That's a concern that some people have is like, will I be able to get these new clients? I never had that issue. The majority of my clients came either through social media or through referrals. So we have a local doctor who's trained in Creighton and a lot of times she'll send her patients to come learn charting with us so that she can work with them on the medical side. We also get a lot of referrals locally through word of mouth, just through the churches and things like that. We do training for every single couple who's getting married in the church in South Florida. And so a lot of them start charting. And then, like I said, social media, Instagram and YouTube are great ways to spread the word about Creighton. And people are so interested when they learn about what this is. They want to learn about it. They want to start charting. And so I've had tons and tons of clients come through there. The same as your first super supervised practicum, you're going to continue meeting with your supervisor. After you have two follow-ups with a new client, you're going to send off their paperwork to your supervisor for feedback. Make sure you're doing everything properly, not making any mistakes, that you're learning and integrating the material, and that you're properly managing their charts. Once you have a certain number of clients in your second supervised practicum, then you schedule your on-site visit. So your on-site visit is where your supervisor is gonna come to where you live, to where you work. They're gonna see your workspace, observe you with your clients. So they're gonna observe you doing an introductory session. They're gonna observe you doing follow-up sessions. They're gonna check out your filing cabinet, make sure all your files are in order, and just generally see how you are in a professional setting working with your clients. And you get graded on all of that, and that's a big part of the program. Program. Typically, while the supervisor will come, since we've been going through this throughout the COVID stage situation and everything was kind of up in the air, all of my clients I was working with completely virtually during the time where I was supposed to have my on-site visit. So I actually ended up doing a virtual on-site visit. My supervisor did not have to fly from New York to Florida to observe me because I was doing everything online anyway. We would get on Zoom together and then my client would join us and she would observe my sessions and grade me that way. So that was a difference that happened because of COVID. I would imagine that that's something that's going to continue because a lot of people probably will be doing primarily virtual from now on. That's going to be different. That's something that's going to shift about the program. In the past, it's always been in-person on-site visits. So I'm not sure exactly what that might look like for you if you decide to get this training, but that's what it looked like for me. And then the last part of all of this training program is once you do EP1, you do EP2, you pass all those exams, you pass all your assignments, you have the number of clients you need to see, and you pass your on-site visit, then you're eligible to sign up and register for your final, final exam. This is the national standardized final exam to become a Creighton practitioner. So it's long. It was about six hours long. You take it on a Saturday. It's something that you get someone that you know to proctor your exam. You get the paperwork mailed to you. Then you mail your exam back once you finish. And it takes about eight to 10 weeks to get your results. So I took my final exam in February. I think it was February 20th of 2021. And I haven't gotten my results yet. So I'm praying that I passed, 
Please pray for me that I passed so I don't have to retake any part of the exam. In my opinion, and I really, really don't like exams, I don't feel like I'm a great test taker in general, I thought it was really hard. I've heard from other people that they think it's pretty easy or pretty straightforward, and I know most people do pass it on the first try, but I just felt like it was really hard. I don't know if I passed or not, so I'm hoping I did, I'm praying I did, but if not, it's not the end of the world. I'll retake the parts that need to be retaken. Okay, so it's been a couple of hours since I just filmed the video that you are currently watching and I just had to add in here an update because I just literally five minutes ago got an email letting me know that I passed my exam. So I am officially a Creighton practitioner and I'm so happy and so excited. Just had to add that in here, give you guys a little update because I'm still sitting in the exact same spot that I was a few hours ago. Okay, on with it. At this point, once you do pass that practitioner exam, you'll become a full Creighton fertility care practitioner. You'll no longer be working with a supervisor and you'll just be seeing clients on your own. If I don't, for some reason, like right now in the interim where I have finished my practicum technically, but I haven't found out that I passed my exam yet, so I'm still working under supervision. I still meet with my supervisor monthly, but as soon as I become a practitioner, then I'll no longer do that. So that's kind of the general idea of what it looks like to become a Creighton fertility care practitioner. It was a lot of work, it was a lot of time, and it is a financial commitment, and I really didn't know what I was getting myself into in the beginning of it, and some parts of the process, especially the paperwork and some of the very specific things, definitely were frustrating at times, but I'm so grateful for the experience and I wouldn't change a thing. I'm so grateful that I have the ability to teach women and couples about their fertility. I'm so passionate about this topic, I would do it a million times over, and I'm really grateful for the opportunity that I had to receive a scholarship to go and become trained. If this is something you're considering getting training in, I would highly recommend it, especially if you're in the medical field, if you're a nurse, a PA, a doctor, anything like that, and you want additional training so you know about Creighton, you know about natural fertility cycles, you can help educate women and couples about this, I highly recommend it. We need more people in the medical field who are educated about this because that's what I heard over and over again from the women that I trained with was that they went to medical school and they didn't learn any of this. So we need you, if you're feeling the call to become trained, I highly encourage you to do it. If you have questions about it, leave a comment below, send me a DM on Instagram. I'll try to be as helpful as I can. But yeah, I hope this was helpful. I get tons of questions about what it looked like to become a practitioner. I just wanted to share more about my experience and my journey to getting to this point. I hope you enjoyed this video and found it helpful. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and I will see you in my next video. Bye.